Thank you so much for that introduction, and thank you for inviting me to, uh, to present this work. I'd like to begin by acknowledging uh, the following colleagues and the following sources of funding. Renal cell carcinoma, or RCC, is one of the most common types of kidney cancer in adults, representing over 90% of all cases. It's also the most lethal of all jet and urinary cancer. The local disease, being stage 1 or stage 2, is treatable with a complete surgical resection of the affected kidney. However, the advanced stage, when the disease has begun to metastasize, is resistant to radiotherapy and resistant to chemotherapy, but is highly dependent on angiogenesis, making anti-angiogenic therapies one of the frontline treatment for this type of cancer. So very briefly, what is tumor-induced angiogenesis? It's the cancer-mediated growth of new blood vessels. This new vascular bed supports additional development of the primary tumor, and the leaky vessels provide a highway for metastatic spread. As mentioned previously, Anti-angiogenic drugs are routinely used as a frontline therapy in the treatment of RCC. However, 30% of patients will exhibit de novo or pre-existing drug resistance, which greatly reduces um, overall and progression-free survival. Therefore, there's a need for a way to screen for patient-specific drug efficacy. So how can we screen for drugs? Well, we're interested in anti-angiogenic agents, so we need an angiogenic environment. And for that, we'll be using the choroallantoic membrane or the CAM for short, of the chick embryo. We wanted patient specificity, so we're gonna be using patient-derived xenografts, or derived from patient tissues. And we also need some way to quantify what's happening to the vasculature within the tumor. And for that, we'll be relying on quantitative imaging uh, using ultrasound. We've tested a number of other modalities, including uh, OCT and bioluminescence, and uh, it's, it's pretty unequivocal that ultrasound is really the modality you wanna be using for this. It provides vascular detail through the entire volume. It's non-destructive, pretty longitudinal study. It's simple to implement in the CAM, and it's fast and inexpensive. The objectives then of this project were to develop a rapid patient-derived xenograft model of RCC in the chorioentelic membrane uh, through the direct engraftment of RCC tumor fragments and tissues to evaluate patient-specific treatment response. We wanted to test clinically relevant anti-angiogenic drugs with particular focus on sunitinib, which is the current frontline therapy that's used in Canada. We also wanted actual results within an eight-week time frame. Currently, after a patient is diagnosed with the disease, they go in for a complete or partial nephrectomy. They're given eight weeks to recover, and then they get their first course of their anti-angiogenic agent. So we want to know, within those eight weeks, will this patient be resistant or sensitive to for example, sunitinib, and if they are resistant to sunitinib, um, it might be better to get one of the competing drugs, such as pazopinib or sorofinib. Now, the um, uh, scanning tumors that are engrafted into the CAM with ultrasound is a relatively unexplored area of research, so we also needed to develop ultrasound protocols specifically for CAM xenografts. We were interested in uh, developing volumetric scans uh, with B mode to get um, high quality anatomical details, as well as po power Doppler ultrasound to um, measure the feeding arterioles surrounding the tumor. We also wanted to know what was happening at the capillary level, and for that we rely on perfusion imaging using contrast enhanced ultrasound. So what is the chorioallantoic membrane, or the CAM for short? It's the respiratory organ of the chicken embryo. It's this densely vascularized membrane that's visible just below the shell surface. And this engages in gas exchange. Um, we use an ex ovo or out of the shell model for our xenografts. And so the embryo is visible here. This is the yolk. And floating above the albumin is this uh, planar vascular network. And that is the CAM. This provides a highly vascular engraftment site for our xenografts, and the limited immune system of the embryo means that there's very little risk of xenograft rejection. Um, so onto PDX designs, we have two main design types. One involves the direct tumor fragment engraftment, so we take patient tumor samples and directly engraft them onto the CAM. And the second type involves the production of a patient-derived cell line um, for on-plants onto the CAM. On-plants is just a, an in-lab term that is synonymous with engraftment, so I'm, I may be using these interchangeably during the presentation. Uh, these two PDX design types represent a trade-off between uh, the speed of the study versus the number of drugs that can be tested, uh, the overall patient representation, the technical skill that's required, and the appropriate ultrasound metrics that can be used for comparison. I'll be going over this a bit more detail when we focus on each individual type. 
So for direct fragmenting graftment, uh, patient tumor fragments are grown directly on the CAM. This is thought to be more representative of the patients um, due to the fact that there's no selection on plastic, and we kind of we, we capture tumor heterogeneity um, more completely in that case. It's also a very fast technique. The engraftment of each individual, each individual tumor fragment um, takes at most a minute per animal, so we can easily get hundreds of animals within uh, a two or three week time frame. Uh, some disadvantages of this technique are that there's less control over the uh, total amount of cells that are uh, engrafted per tumor fragment. Um, and this, this is important when you consider uh, the use of um, tumor volume as measured by volumetric ultrasound. So we can't use, um, say, B-mode anatomical volume to compare a DMSO versus a drug-treated tumor because we can't control the number of cells in each individual fragment. Um, a, a second limitation of the study is that it, it's truly a one-shot study. We, we have limited samples. Um, the patient comes in from the nephrectomy. We get the patient fragments. We have to engraft them immediately, and everything needs to be done in, uh, within that, that like, almost two-week time frame. So uh, there's, there's no going back. Everything has to be done um, immediately. So for the patient tumor fragment engraftment, the patient comes in, they're exhibiting the disease, and they go in for their either their full or partial nephrectomy. And beforehand, we also prepare uh, a large number of chicken embryos for engraftment. We take a number of biopsies from the patient's tumor. We subdivide these biopsies into smaller tumor fragments, generally at least 40 fragments per biopsy. We open a small window in the, the surface of the cam, and then we directly deposit these uh, tumor fragments or these tumor chunks onto the embryo. We then uh, seal the wound with a small amount of matrix gel. Um, these tumor fragments are allowed to rest for two days, so we can filter out all the fragments that either did not take on the cam or the animals that have died within that, that sort of um, two-day period. And then we begin a topical application of our selected anti-angiogenic agent or a vehicle control. Um, for these studies, we've been mostly uh, testing DMSO versus sunitinib. And here's an example of one of the tumors in the study at an early time point. Uh, I hope you can see this. The, the tumor is this small white dot here. And uh, it appears to be relatively healthy. Uh, it's, it's growing well, or at least it's engrafted well. And there's even evidence of uh, spoking vasculature or radiating away from it, uh, which implies that there is um, going to be vasculature growing into the tumor. So the, the PDX study timeline, if we count day zero as being the day that the eggs are fertilized, on day four, we crack the eggs into our way boats. Again, we use an ex-ovo model, and we have um, two people here who are, are really adept at doing the egg cracking, and they, they can they can produce um, just absolutely massive end numbers for us. So we typically start with about five or 600 cracked eggs here. And the embryos are then allowed to uh, just rest until day nine, which is the, the sort of the, the prime point for when they will receive, um, when we'll have the highest efficiency of engraftment. We've, we've tested a number of time points um, along, this, along this timeline, and really day nine seems to be the, the best point to do this. And so we, we engraft the tumors. Um, we typically do about nine biopsies per patient uh, and 40 fragments from each biopsy. So that is 360 animals that we engraft at this time point. Um, with two operators that are, that are skilled or at least adept at doing this, um, usually takes about a minute per engraft. So doing this whole thing for two people would be more or less an entire day, day of work. Um, we usually get two or three groups to do this, so that takes um, you know, an hour and a half to two hours in this case. We then wait two days to make sure that, again, we're not drug dosing tumors that either wouldn't have taken or on animals that were going to die anyway. Um, and then on day 11, we begin the first dose of topical drug. And um, we typically lose about, I'd say at most, 20% of our animals. So in this example, we have about 280 animals left. So this course of, of topical drug dosing uh, continues every two days, so day 13, day 15, until imaging on day 17 to 18, where we have on the order of 150 to 200 animals. Um, so this is, this is a quite an involved scan at this point. Um, if we factor in about five minutes for a volumetric scan and 
say, 10 minutes for a contrast enhanced scan just to coordinate the injection and then you know, actually getting the thinning loops here, uh, you're looking at um, a, a pretty long scan time in this case. So it usually does, usually does last until uh, the morning of day 18. So just be prepared if you're planning on doing a, a study of this magnitude that your scan is going to be a little bit, a little bit arduous there. So the, the use of the, the CAM model isn't really new to oncology, but previous studies use what we term conventional forms of CAM analysis. And these include tumor take rates and light microscopy, which really provide a low amount of vascular detail, or they're highly destructive methods that are reserved only for endpoint, and these include tumor resection and histology. Um, in this example image, we have this tumor that is, is growing quite well on the CAM. This is a, this is a pretty massive tumor section. Uh, and you can see, you know, there's, there's a lot of tissue that's kind of poking out of the surface of the CAM here, and there's even a lot of superficial vasculature that's, that's visible on the surface of this tumor. Uh, this was nine days post-engraftment, so this is about the time that we'll be doing the, the ultrasound scanning. Um, but when we excise this tumor for uh, histology, we know that the vast majority of the tumor mass and vasculature was actually below the surface of the CAM. And so to kind of guide you here, uh, we placed a glass slide over this tumor where the CAM is growing over top the surface of the tumor, and then we cut around it and flipped it. So this is the same tumor, just upside down. And so uh, the CAM is on the bottom of this, of this image, and the, the tumor is protruding out. Uh, and, and indeed, when we actually went through and did the tumor resection, there was a, a ton of vasculature within the tumor mass itself. And so uh, a simple metric like micro light microscopy really isn't going to capture uh, much in the way of vascular data here. And so we posit that there's a need for more vascular detail in uh, non-destructive CAM imaging. And for that, of course, we rely on ultrasound. And this is a, this is a very ultrasound-centric group, so I'm not going to preach to the choir here. Uh, suffice to say that of the modalities that we've tested, ultrasound is really the modality you want to be using here. Nothing, nothing has really come close, to, uh, come, come close to being able to get the images that we can with ultrasound. Um, so if you are interested in using ultrasound for um, this type of CAM model or similar model, I want to point out just uh, a couple of the obstacles that we've had to overcome in getting this to, getting the, the CAM model to work with ultrasound. And the vast majority of the problems can be summarized in that it's difficult to couple the ultrasound transducer with the CAM in such a way that won't damage the animal. Now it isn't it isn't obvious if you haven't worked with the with the CAM model before or even from the images which are um, you know still. But the CAM itself it's this very delicate, very thin membrane that's highly pliable. And if you do the 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 simple thing and just put gel on top and then couple your transducer to it, uh, you'll find that the you know the gel is going to cause a, a big indent in the cam, and when you move the transducer back and forth, the cam is going to drag with it, and um, you're going to end up with you know a lot of tearing of the animal, and you're probably going to end up with with dead animals from, with data sets you can't really use. And so this is a problem for two reasons: one, it 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 kills all your animals, and two. Um, if you're doing any sort of volumetric scan, you're going to be dragging the tissue along as you move it along with the motor. So your nice spherical looking tumors are going to end up being more of a, a sausage shape when you do your 3D reconstruction. Of course, and that data set, um, just due to the motion artifact, is, is basically garbage at that point. Uh, a second thing to consider is that the, the CAM is the main source of gas exchange for the animal. And so the simple solution of just flooding the surface with water uh, really isn't going to gain you much. Sure, you can, you can couple the transducer to it uh, fairly easily now, but your animal has, has long since died from asphyxiation. So it's not really a tenable solution. Um, it's also important if you consider the, the footprint of the transducer on the surface of the cam. Um, if you're scanning too large of an area, you're going to have this massive region of hypoxia, which may influence your um, vascular results as a consequence. You're going to occlude a lot of the vessels that you're image, interested in imaging. Uh, a final consideration here, and this was um, one of those fun discoveries, um, was that the, the vast majority of the gels that are uh, commercially available for ultrasound scanning, uh, like, like the Aquasonics Blue Gel, um, is actually toxic to the surface of the cam. And so if you use that gel directly uh, for a longitudinal scan, you'll find that after your first scan, uh, your end number is going to drop 
drastically as the vast majority of our animals will die from the toxicity. We haven't really found a good solution for this yet. We've tried making a number of in-lab um, sort of homemade gels with agar and agarose, but we haven't been able, able to get the, the consistency or the viscosity of the gel um, good enough for what we want to do. And, uh, you know, it's just, it's, it's ongoing work. So we haven't, we haven't gotten a good solution to that. Uh, the workaround that we've been doing is to sort of hand mold a, a, a gel pad with the, the thicker blue gel on the surface of the transducer. So you just flip the transducer so it's facing upward, um, put the gel on top and kind of, kind of smooth it out so it produces this nice gel pad. And this one provides coupling between the, the transducer and the cam for the, for the next step, but two also provides a bit of an acoustic standoff to push uh, your, your tissues into the focal depth of your transducer. Um, so the, the tissues of interest for the cam are really, really close to the surface, and so you want to kind of get a little, bit of a, a little bit of a window here, a bit of a standoff just to kind of push it into that focal zone. Uh, the, the next step in this workaround is to apply just, just three or four drops of PBS just on the surface of the tumor. Uh, and this provides a bit of lubrication for the gel and make sure and ensures that the gel is not directly contacting the cam. And so you then very lightly couple the transducer to the PBS and it kind of produces this uh, almost a meniscus effect where it suctions to the gel and you move it back and forth to kind of lubricate the area and allows the transducer to glide without dragging the cam. Um, other things to consider, uh, the, the dish itself is quite shallow, so you'll end up with reverberations off of the bottom of the dish. We've been fortunate in that the, uh, the reverberation, um, like the, it produces a pretty big, pretty big line in BMO images. It tends to, it, in all cases, has been above the imaging plane that we're interested in, so we can just kind of crop it out of our images. Um, and one final thing is uh, you really need to keep the animals warm. Uh, one, so that they'll survive, so 36 to 39 degrees Celsius is more or less what you want to target. You need to keep them warm also to keep the vessels from uh, constricting too much, and again, that's going to negatively affect your, ima your images. So we, we take the transducer, we couple it to the cam, and we get an image like this. And uh, just, just to guide you here, there's, there's no tumor in this image. This is just an image of the cam itself. Uh, you can see that, that sort of strong reflection off the bottom of the dish here. Um, again, it's, it's well above uh, any sort of imaging region that we're interested in. A second note is this is B-mode imaging, and this is B-mode imaging only. There's no contrast agent added to this image. So when you couple the transducer to the, to the cam, uh, you, can, you can very easily visualize this, um, this, this speckle pattern, this, this sparkliness from the blood flow that is flowing through. And so it's, it's, a bit, it's a bit of a fortuitous coincidence that the, the cam itself, their red blood cells are nucleated. And at 40 megahertz, 50 megahertz, the transducers that we use, um, they scatter a ton of signal back to the transducer. So you can, you can visualize blood flow down to really small vessels using just B-mode imaging. It's, it's not quite clear at this point how to quantify this data and to be really handy to be able to just use B-mode imaging to quantify vascular data. Um, we have a collaborator that's working on signal processing to try to get a, a mask of where all the blood flow is. Um, and that, that work is still ongoing, so I don't want to talk too much about it. But uh, suffice to say, these images are really interesting. You can kind of qualitatively validate that you have blood flow. There's a, a vessel that's coming in the plane here and then moving out of the plane. You can see branching there. There are two vessels in cross-section right here. There's some smaller vessels and blood flow throughout. Um, now let's look at a B-mode image of a tumor. So the tumor is right here. Uh, this is the surface of the cam. Here's a, a smaller arterial, that's again, kind of passing in and out of the imaging plane. And uh, the same sort of story, you can see a lot of this, uh, again, sparkliness, for lack of a better term, throughout the entire tumor volume. And this, this implies that this tumor um, is, is really well vascularized. And so we were interested in doing uh, volumetric ultrasound imaging to get you know, estimates of tumor volume. And we do this by taking our, our BMO transducer and fixing it to the linear stepper motor that is, is supplied by Visual Sonics. Um, and we step this uh, step by step at every step gathering a two-dimensional BMO image. And again, this is just this line right here is just the reflection um, off of the bottom of the dish. Um, and so using the 
the provided uh, Visual Sonic software, we can we can combine those sli those serial slices, much like the, the slices in a loaf of bread, to produce these these reconstructed three-dimensional volumes. We're just we're just stepping through the the different planes here, and uh, we're going to go to a rendering where you can see that the um, the tumor itself is is well encapsulated from the the surrounding cam tissues, and this means that any sort of segmentation that you do on the tumor is going to be um, it's going to be very repeatable. Um, both of you do it multiple times if you want to test, you know, how well does this operator segment the tumor, but also between operators. So um, we've we've had a summer student do this, the same segmentations as that I've done for analysis, and our results are, are really, really close together. And this, of course, means that uh, we're getting this, this very precise, very repeatable estimate of tumor volume in this case. So we combine this this 3D acquisition with uh, Power Doppler, which detects the, the the volume blood flow in the larger feeding arterioles to produce these reconstructed three-dimensional vascular networks of, of the the feeding vasculature. And so this is this is kind of a just like a representative tumor, nothing too special about it. And you can see we have a lot of feeding vasculature throughout the tumor mass, and that implies that there's going to be a lot of capillaries in the center of the tumor as well. Oh, we can't actually measure that with power Doppler. It's mostly um, for the for the feeding vasculature. And to get an idea of of what a, a 2D power Doppler image looks like, this is just a, a cine loop of one of our tumors. This is about 20 frames or so, so it's going to repeat pretty quickly. Um, just some things to note: uh, the tumor is this mass right here. We're getting we're getting a little bit of of cam doubling, as it's as it's termed in our lab, where um, the, um, the the cam kind of scars a bit due to the fact that we are inducing a wound to engraft the tumor into it. But regardless, you can see, um, you know, just just blood vessels permeating through it, um, and there's a lot of pulsatility. We get, you know, a different estimate of blood flow as as the heartbeat of the animal goes through. Um, we're, we're still trying to optimize the settings for power Doppler. We're more or less happy with the results we have now, um, but there's just a couple of things we'd like to like to clean up. Um, I'm not sure if you can see it on the presentation, but there's still that evidence of just the B-mode speckle pattern that implies blood flow is not being picked up by power Doppler. Um, and at the same time, uh, we're, we're running some, some artifacts, say, here, um, but that, that's mostly, you know, we have to adjust our wall filter a bit. We have to adjust our PRF and so forth to kind of really optimize that. Um, but yeah, we're, we're, we're happy with the results we have so far. Uh, and we, we quantify our power Doppler results using just the, the in-house Vivo software. It's very simple. You segment out the tumor volume and you get the total number of voxels within that segmentation volume. And you also get the total number of color pixels. And these are the, so it's a, a binary classification. These pixels are the ones that had detected volume blood flow, and so you divide this number by that number, and it, it says that around 20% or 21% of this tumor volume is vasculature. Of course, this is done on a slice-by-slice -slice basis to get an estimate of the vasculature throughout the whole tumor volume. We were also interested in quantifying tumor perfusion. Um, for this, we swap out, we typically use the, the 40 megahertz transducer. We swap it out for a 20 megahertz transducer instead uh, that um, is, is capable of doing a nonlinear contrast enhanced imaging. And we fix this transducer of approxim above approximately the center of the tumor mass, and then we inject a contrast agent, in this case, uh, a gas-filled shell-stabilized microbubble. The, um, the Vivo Micromarker contrast agent kit is what, what we inject in here. Um, and so by, by just logging the contrast signal, the, the flow of microbubbles through this imaging plane over time, we can infer a number of perfusion parameters and therefore uh, the capillary level effects of what's going on here uh, based on the curved shape, for instance. The, the peak enhancement level depends on the vascular volume and the time to peak depends on the flow velocity. Uh, just a couple of side notes. If you've done contrast enhanced imaging on mice before, uh, the vascular volume or the, the blood pool um, volume of the chicken embryo is comparable to that of a mouse, um, particularly on the time point that we do our imaging. So the injection volume that you'd want, about 50 microliters per mouse, is, is about right for the chicken embryo. Um, but uh, a, a thing to consider is that the amount of tissue between the 
blood vessels that you're interested in, the ones that are within the tumor volume, and the transducer itself, there, there really isn't much there. And so the contrast signal is not going to be attenuated um, through the tissue very much at all. And so you'd be well served in, in diluting the contrast agent a bit. So um, during my mouse studies, we've typically done the recommendation of uh, 700 microliters per um, vial of contrast agent. For the CAM, um, we've had good results with diluting that down to about 1,000 microliters per vial. Um, and at, at 50 microliters of contrast agent per animal, that if, if, you're, if you're perfect with your injections is going to be about, about 19, 20 animals or so with, with some waste um, per injection and so forth. If you're not great at the injections, like like I am, I'm kind of middling at it. Uh, that's closer to about 15 animals, so you can still get a pretty good data set uh, per vial in that case, even if you're not the best at the injections. Uh, and those those injections are quite difficult. It's pretty well. It's, it's basically impossible to coordinate the injection of the contrast agent into this very fine capillary network of the CAM with keeping the transducer fixed above the center of the tumor. So bolus contrasted imaging um, really is impossible, at least n not as not in as far as we've been able to do it. Um, so instead, we've been relying on destruction reperfusion imaging. Um, for this, we we've been using a dissecting microscope in a room that's adjacent to the ultrasound scanner. We inject our 50 microliters of, of uh, micro bubbles into the animal, and it it, it is allowed to perfuse through the vasculature uh, back and forth. Um, the lifetime of the bubbles. Is, it's going to be about 20 to 30 minutes in the cam, I would say. Wouldn't go much longer than half an hour, but that's that's a good time point. Um, so there's plenty of time to allow it to perfuse, move the animal over, and couple it to the transducer. And because the bubbles have been have been flowing through and doing a, a full circulation of the vasculature, all the organs are, are fully perfused with bubbles at this point. And so when we fix the transducer and couple it to the to the tumor, uh, the number of bubbles that enter into the imaging plane is going to equal the number of bubbles that exit the imaging plane. And so the, the contrast signal intensity over time is going to be more or less a constant. Now, the, the contrast agent, the, the vivo micromarker, they're, they are microbubbles, and so they're susceptible to being popped. And we do that uh, in panel B, where we just induce a, a high MI or a high intensity ultrasound pulse to, to burst all the bubbles within that imaging plane. Um, and this, this functions as what, as what is effectively a negative bolus, and it drops the contrast signal back down to the tissue baseline. We then continue scanning and allow the bubbles to reperfuse back into this imaging plane, and this produces, um, it's, it's drawn here as a mono-exponential. It's, it's almost a mono-exponential curve. It's actually a bit closer to a, to a sigmoidal curve, but um, it's, it's to your discretion as to which indicator dilution model you want to fix to it. Um, and so destruction reperfusion imaging for, for contrast imaging has a number of advantages over bolus imaging. Uh, one, it, it's, it's actually possible to do on the CAM, but that's, that's very specific to this experimental design. Uh, two, the input kinetics for your indicator dilution model are, are much simpler than bolus imaging. You only have to worry about the adjacent vasculature. You don't have to worry about much of the upstream effects, uh, the, the sort of the bolus spreading that occurs due to, the, due to passing through a bunch of organs before actually entering into the imaging plane. And three, once you hit this, uh, this asymptote here, uh, you can repeat the destruction sequence either multiple times within the same imaging plane. So, you know, burst, refill, burst, refill to test for the repeatability of your estimates of perfusion, you know, the wash-in rate and the peak enhancement and so forth. Or you can move the transducer to a different imaging plane wait a bit and then do the destruction sequence again to get more of a global view of what's happening with the perfusion in the tumor. And that's what we do for, for our tumors. We, we gather one imaging plane at about the center of the tumor, wait for it to hit a steady state, and then move the transducer to about the, the three quarters. So it's a, it's a parallel plane, but it's a little bit to the side. Get a second um, cine loop and then move it back, still parallel, to the one quarter here get that, and then move the transducer so it's perpendicular and get a final destruction cine loop. So to get an idea of what contrast-enhanced ultrasound looks like in the cam, here are two maximum intensity projection videos over time. Uh, I haven't started the videos yet, so don't worry if you can't actually see anything. 
Uh, I just wanted to introduce this before we, we show the images. So this was this was actually the study that that started the whole interest of using contrast enhanced ultrasound on uh, on CAM xenografts in the first place. Um, we were given a cell line by a collaborator who uh, the cell line was infamous for being just really really aggressive. It grew massive tumors in very in a very short time frame, and the tumors themselves were highly highly vascularized. And so the, the collaborator gave us the cell line, and they also gave us this drug called Tax Four Four One. Um, which is a, a hedgehog inhibitor that is hypothesized to be highly anti-angiogenic. Highly anti-angiogenic. Um, don't worry too much about this, this drug. It, as, as far as I know, it, it's not going to be used clinically at all. So uh, this is this is interesting mostly within the terms of this pilot study. And so I'll start these videos so you can see that the control tumor very quickly fills in with the contrast agent, revealing this this dense vascular network. You can see these, these just massive vessels throughout, but also this sort of blushing enhancement, uh, particularly in the periphery of the tumor, which implies that we're getting a, a really dense capillary network that's flowing in there. Uh, by comparison, the, the tax 4 for one treated tumor, the drug-treated treated tumor, um, it appears basically avascular. And so even, even qualitatively, it's really easy to believe that we're getting a, a significant difference between these two, these two tumor groups. And that, that, that panned out for the, the quantifications. So we have the, the power Doppler quantification at the top, these two. So we had a significant decrease in the tumor volume and a trend toward reduced tumor vascularity. Um, this, is, this is really an, an estimate of the, the, the feeding arterials into the tumor itself. And for the contrast data, we had a significant decrease in relative blood flow and a trend toward reduced blood volume. Um, we, I mean, if you look at this data, it's, it's pretty easy to believe that we would have gotten a significant result for uh, all four of these indices. Um, it's just that the study itself, being a, a pilot study, was, was severely underpowered. We only had an N of four in each case. But um, d despite that, these results are, are pretty extraordinary. And uh, those results are, are corroborated by the histology from this, this trial, where we see that the control tumors uh, have a very, very dense microvascular density, whereas the, the tax 4 for one treated tumors, um, there, there are regions of necrosis in the tumor, and the microvascular density overall is much, much lower. So on to the main meat of the talk, um, patient-specific sinitin and resistance. We wanted to ask specifically, does tumor heterogeneity have functional consequences in terms of drug resistance? And for this, I'm going to go uh, over the, the data from, from two patients in detail. And these patients uh, both came in exhibiting very, very large uh, primary RCC tumors, as well as a number of uh, nearby lymph node metastases. Both patients went in for a complete nephrectomy, uh, as well as the removal of the, the afflicted lymph nodes. And each for both patients, um, we gathered six biopsies from the primary tumor from distant locations around the tumor mass to try to get full coverage of tumor heterogeneity, as well as three biopsies from their um, lymph node metastases. And each of these biopsies was then subdivided into 40 samples, and each sample was then directly engrafted onto the CAM. And then two days later, half of those samples received sedentinib, half of them received DMSO. And so this is, this is a tale of two patients. We're going to start with patient 29. And as a, just a, a quick and dirty way to test if the uh, direct fragment engraft is actually growing well, we took a number of light microscopy images from this tumor. And so you can see on day 11, this is two days post-engraftment, uh, the, the tumor fragment appears, well, healthy. It's, it's, it's pink. It's, uh, it's not, it doesn't appear necrotic at all. Uh, and it's, it, it looks like it's, it's taken. It's engrafted well. Four days later, on day 15, you can see the, the morphology of the tumor has changed. There's evidence of growth. There is also evidence of, of vasculature sort of spoking into and in around the tumor. And on day 19, this is one day after we, would, after we imaged it, um, the, the tumor appears much, much larger than, than it did on day 11. And uh, like the overall morphology has changed, too. It's much more of a, a spheroid in this case. Um, and so here is the power Doppler data from the primary tumor fragments. Um, it's tumor volume on the left and tumor vascularity on the right. Just to, to guide you through here, uh, each of the pair of bars is a different core. So these two black bars, bars excuse me, are core one, 
core 2, core 3, core 4, core 5, core 6. And the, um, the pairs of bars are vehicle-treated uh, fragments on the left and sunitinib-treated vehicles, or sorry, sorry sunitinib-treated fragments on the right. Um, I'll remind you that for the direct tumor fragment engraftments, we can't control the size of the fragments to a very fine degree, so tumor volume really isn't useful, as far as we can tell, as a metric for uh, assessing drug response. And so this is mostly included here for completeness, uh, but I wouldn't read too much into it. If you look instead at the, the primary tumor vascularity as measured by power Doppler, so again, the, the degree of, of feeding vasculature in the tumor, uh, we noted that three of the cores had a significant decrease in their feeding vasculature uh, in response to synaptic therapy, and uh, core number six here, um, this is not significant, but it's, it's almost significant. This is the, the infamous P equal to 0 0.06 case where you, you are almost significant, but not quite. Um, if we look at the contrast-enhanced data, um, we, we note a similar but, but slightly different result where the, the primary tumor blood volume is significantly decreased for three of the fragments, um, and there, there isn't really much going on in the other three. Um, the primary tumor blood flow is, is included here uh, again, kind of for completeness, it isn't entirely clear to us how to interpret these results as of yet. Uh, and there's really two schools of thought. One school of thought states that anti-angiogenic agents should, um, you know, just destroy the, the vasculature, and so you'll have a, a decrease in blood volume as well as a decrease in blood flow because you're, you're starving the tumor right now. Uh, a more modern school of thought set, states that you dose an anti-angiogenic agent, you're going to get a decrease in blood volume because you're pruning a lot of vessels, but you're also making the network, uh, you're, you're normalizing the network a bit, so you're going to have an increase in tumor blood flow, as you can see in, in core number two here. And, and generally, vascular normalization is seen as a, a good thing for um, um, anti-angiogenic agents used in conjunction with uh, chemotherapeutics to improve drug dosage, or um, radiation therapy to um, in, you know, improve the production of, of reactive oxidative, oxidative species. Um, it, again, it isn't clear which of those two cases is happening or if both cases are happening. Um, and secondly, it's also not clear which of those two would be better for RCC patients where anti-angiogenic agents are used um, quite often as a monotherapy. And so, it, you know, it, is vascular normalization better in that case, or is, is vascular obliteration better in that case? It's not quite clear. And so we've, we often opted to be a bit conservative here, and we include the blood flow data for completeness, but we're not actually drawing any conclusions from it. Now, this patient also had uh, three metastatic tumor fragments that were studied. Um, and in this case, you can see that for the, the tumor vascularity as measured by power Doppler, we have a significant decrease kind of across the board. All three of the cores appear to respond. And for contrast-enhanced data, uh, it's, it's a similar, similar result where two of them are responding well, and one of them is, is kind of, we're not quite sure what's going on there. It's well vascularized, but there's less you know, feeding vasculature in that case. And uh, a, big, a big question for these types of studies is, you know, we've, we've measured these tumors in the CAM, um, but does that translate to the patients? You know, if, if this tumor is sensitive in the chicken embryo, uh, who cares? Like, th does, that, does that apply to the patient itself? And this is still a very early study, so we don't really have the clinical outcome data yet to say definitively, you know, yes, sensitivity in the CAM will correlate with sensitivity in the patient. But most of the evidence is pointing that way. Uh, one, one particularly compelling piece of evidence is that uh, the tumor subtype is maintained post-engraftment. And so this is an H&E stained section uh, taken from a primary tumor fragment that was engrafted into the CAM. And this is taken at the study endpoint. So we'd already scanned this, and we extracted it, and did histology on it. And uh, it, the histological examination revealed that there's viable xenograft tissue um, in, in, in the on plants, which is, you know, we already kind of knew that because it was growing on the CAM. But it also noted that all the cells had a clear cell RCC subtype. So the, the subtype, the type of cancer that's growing in the patient was also growing in the CAM. And so that's pretty strong evidence that, um, you know, 
phenotypically these, these cells are, are similar to what they would be in the patient itself. jumped ahead a bit. Um, just as an aside, um, here's a, a contrast-enhanced ultrasound example image. Uh, this is just an image, it's not a video, so it shouldn't be playing anything. Uh, just to note that some of the sunitinib-sensitive tumor, tumors exhibited um, what we term a, a peripheral contrast enhancement uh, type or pattern, where the, the center of the tumor is, is basically a vascular, but the periphery is still quite vascularized. And, um, you know, there's, there's a lot of literature saying that this this type of enhancement pattern correlates well with um, with tumors that are responding to to antiangiogenic therapy and overall patient survival. But it's mostly just a curiosity at this point. Um, so on to the next patient, patient 25. We're, we'll note that it, it's it's not so rosy for all of our patients. Uh, for this patient, this is the Power Doppler data. Um, only one of their primary tumor fragments actually responded to everything else. Um, there is like maybe a trend to response here, but there's there's really not much going on except for core number three, and the the this result is also consistent with the uh, the contrast enhanced data, data, where two of the cores uh, appear to be responding with contrast data, and there's one core with a, a trend toward uh, decreased blood volume. Um, core two here we have it highlighted as significant, but Honestly, this data set's a little bit suspect to me, just due to the to the response and the the sinitinib, um tumor set. So I'm going to have to go back and look at this data set to see if it can actually be included. Um, but yeah, this this result is a, it's a little bit too much of a of a decrease in blood volume to really be um, reasonable in that case. And uh, the, the, we also measured this met this patient's metastatic tumor fragments, and it's it's more or less the same story. There's not much going on in terms of response to sedentinib. Um, and this, this patient, um, after we did these scans, this patient was later diagnosed with, with a subtype of RCC known as chromophobe RCC. And this subtype is highly resistant to antiangiogenic therapy. Patients with chromophobe RCC never, ever respond to antiangiogenic therapy. And so that, that's really bad for the patient, of course, but it lends a bit of validity for our model in that we're able to detect a patient um, that should be resistant to sinitinib. And so we, we, have, we have our power Doppler data and we have our contrast blood volume data. And they often show similar results, but there's some, there's some contradiction. Um, we needed a way to classify tumor fragments as being sinitinib sensitive here in red or sinitinib resistant um, here, sorry, sinitinib, sinitinib sensitive here in green or sinitinib resistant. Um, here in red, and this is this is just a diagram, diagrammatic example to kind of get an idea of the, the scheme we have going on right now, the the, the way that we classify the tumors. Uh, so don't read too much into the, the actual lines here. This is just kind of this is kind of just for the purposes of this presentation. Um, and so the the way we decided to do this is if we detect a, either a significant or a highly significant decrease in blood volume as measured by contrast ultrasound, which was also highly significant or significant as measured by power Doppler, uh, then we classify this tumor fragment as being sensitive to sinitinib. And uh, just, just as a side note, this is, this is specifically for a decrease in vascularity in response to sinitinib. So if there was an increase in vascularity for whatever reason, um, that's in the non-significant end of things. In uh, sort of the edge case where we, we kind of get that, that P equals 0 0.06, an almost significant case for one or the other, then we, we sort of classify it as being more of a, an unknown. And this could be resistance, this could be sensitive. Uh, we're not quite sure, so we're kind of going to flag it as being uh, an, an unknown case. And if we get not significant for one or the other or both, then we just classify this tumor as being, yes, this tumor fragment is resistant to sedentinib. And uh, I, I apologize if you're red, green, colorblind. Um, you know, this is probably not not the best color scheme for you, but um, for the rest of us, I hope you, I hope this is this is clear to you. And so we we combined this this drug classification data to produce these drug sensitivity matrices. And so to to guide you here, um, these are patients on the on the the, the left hand side here. So patient one, two, three, and four. 
and each of these are the individual core fragments that we looked at. So this is primary fragment one, primary fragment two, fragment three, as well as metastatic fragment one, two, and three here. And each of these are classified as being either stintin sensitive. Um, we also compared them to, to tumors grown using the 7860 um, cell line, which is known to be stintin sensitive, uh, as well as stintin resistant. Um, such as the XP121, which is a patient-derived cell line, which is well known to be resistant to sinitinib. And so um, you can see, for instance, that patient 3, which was patient 29 in our example before, uh, with clear cell RCC, had the vast majority of their cores being uh, sensitive to sinitinib. A couple of them are maybe a bit suspect, but luckily all their metastatic cores appear to be responding well. And these are really the important ones for the patient because all of these cores have been um, uh, removed with the nephrectomy, or at least hopefully so. Uh, in, in comparison, patient four with chromophobe RCC, uh, the vast majority of their cores are resistant to sinitinib, um, and, and also their, their metastatic cores are also not um, going to respond to sinitinib therapy either. And so uh, we've, we've noted from this that our patients will exhibit intratumoral functional heterogeneity both within untreated fragments, so core one will grow differently than core two, even in the DMSO case but also in response to sinitinib therapy. So core four for this patient does not respond to sinitinib, but core one will. Um, so it's, it's interesting to us that we get so much vascularity in these, these really massive core fragments. So we're, we're talking like just, just huge chunks of tissues in some case. Uh, so we decided to explore this a bit. It wasn't making sense to us that, you know, just just de novo angiogenesis would produce that much vasculature. And so for, for this case, just to guide you, this is a, a histology section, um, stained with some you know, immunohistochemistry. Um, this is a merge image, we're kind of focusing in here. We injected the CAM, uh, this particular CAM, with a endothelial cell binding lectin, and that's shown uh, in the red channel. Um, and again, I apologize if you're red, green, colorblind. Um, but the, the lectin channel will bind to all of the active vasculature in this, in this uh, histology section. So these are the vessels that were actively perfusing within the CAM. We then um, you know, extracted the tumor for histology, fixed it, sliced it, and then stained this with CD31, which is a human-specific antibody. And so everything that's stained in green here um, are human um, endothelial cells, and you can see there's there is very good co-localization between the lectin, the, the lectin, and the CD31 channels, which to us implies that um, that human blood vessels are somehow being reperfused with blood when the tumor fragments are engrafted into the cam. So the cam is somehow recannulating these vessels. Um, we, we've only done the study one time. This is basically the image that we got. Uh, so we, we can't say anything too strong here, but it, it appears that there's evidence of, of pre-existing vessel reperfusion in this case. But um, you know, we have to really we have to go back and do this again and again and again just to verify because the results are, are so surprising to us. Um, yeah, like this this is a this is a very interesting result, and this is going to kind of this is going to be important for uh, the, the the next PDX design that we do. So on the PDX designs, we're going to focus now on the, the patient-derived cell line on plants. Uh, and this work is, it's, it's much, um, it isn't as developed as the direct fragment engraftment stuff, so we have less data to go through. Um, but to sort of guide you from this, again, the, the patient comes in, they go in for their nephrectomy, they're, they're exhibiting RCC. We take core fragments from their, um, their tumor but we then transfer those fragments to cell culture, where they're allowed to grow in plastic to, to some high confluence. And once we get enough cells, um, we then trypsinize the cells and transfer them to Eppendorf tubes, where they're then mixed with an equal volume of matrix gel, and the matrix gel provides uh, support for the, the, the patient-derived cells um, for the, the cam engraftments. We then take a, take a volume of this cell, usually about one million cells per, um, open up the cam and then just inject it directly uh, into the opening on the cam. So it's a, it's a very simple, very fast procedure. It takes again about a minute per tumor. So you can really you can get you can get a large data set very quickly this way. Uh, so 
some things to note about this, the, the patient tumor tissues are grown in cell culture prior to engraftment. So the study design is more flexible. You can kind of parse this out for uh, scanning sessions that are a bit more reasonable than having to stay up for you know, 20 hours straight for the, the tumor fragment stuff. Um, and also you can test many drugs uh, per individual biopsy. So you have this cell line growing, you, you, you know, divide your, your culture, you on-plant some of them and you test, say, sinitinib, and then you do the next group and you test exit nib or something. And you can keep going on and on and on over months and months and months to get this, this very in-depth drug, drug um, um, panel on the, on the cells. You also have control over the number of cells that you put in an on-graft. Uh, which means that tumor volume, uh, assuming you actually control this well, is now available for comparison. Because we have one million cells per on plants, we can say, you know, this is decrease in volume is significant or not. Some limitations are that uh, not all the biopsies will grow well in culture, and there's also a selection on plastic, so you're not getting as, as a good representation of the patient in this case. Um, the tumors are also generally smaller than what you'd see in the direct fragment in graft. So, um, we have noticed diminishing returns after about one and a half million cells. Any more cells and the tumors in the end aren't really much bigger. You just kind of end up with more attrition of animals as you go along. Uh, the sweet spot seems to be about one million cells, but the, the maximum tumor volume at, at the time of engrafting is then, um, you know, at most 10 millimeters cubed in comparison to the direct fragment stuff, which we can have you know, hundreds of millimeters cubed. And this kind of ties into the, the recannulation of vessels that we discussed earlier. All of the vessels in this case must be uh, de novo angiogenesis. Um, so we, we decided to use this, this PDX model, the patient drug cell line stuff, to do a drug paneling study where we evaluate uh, patient-specific res treatment response to a number of clinically available anti-angiogenic drugs, uh, not just sinitinib in this case. And so we tested sinitinib, pazofenib, serofinib, exitinib, which are all anti-angiogenic agents, agents, as well as a number of anti-proliferative agents such as sirolimus, everlimus, and torosil, and one chemotherapeutic, um, which I'm never going to be able to pronounce correctly, uh, kept Capacitabin is close enough. Um, and so for this study, again, we had, we had, multiple, we had multiple cores from around the tumor. We wanted to ask, drugs, does, does sensitivity to a specific drug depend on biopsy location? So if drug one is sensitive to exitinib, it, sorry, if core one is sensitive to sinitinib, is core two also sensitive to exitinib? Or if this is resistance to, resistant to pazopinib, is this, um, is this also resistant to panopinib? Um, we also want to ask, does resistance to one drug imply resistance to another? If this is resistant to sinitinib, is it also resi resistant to pazopinib or exitinib and so forth? Uh, and so uh, to do this, this drug paneling study, we first focused on patient 25, uh, more specifically metastatic core number one. Um, for, for this core, it kind of looked like an edge case. It might be sensitive or it might be resistant to sinitinib, but we're edging it up being resistant um, as, as compared to the other two cores. And so we looked at, at core one, and we tested it with, with these drugs. And I'll remind you, this patient was diagnosed with chromophobe RCC, so really shouldn't be responding to sinitinib at all. And we noted that, again, it's kind of consistent with the tumor fragment stuff where we're getting this, you know, there might be a response to sinitinib, but it kind of looks, um, it looks suspect as this being like a real clear-cut case. Um, and other drugs too, like Everlimus, Sirolimus, uh, there's not much of a decrease in tumor volume and vascularity looks pretty consistent across the board. Uh, the real standout for this patient was serofinib, where we got a, a significant decrease in tumor volume and uh, probably a trend, it doesn't look like a significant in this case for serofinib. I can't remember off the top of my head if it was or not. Um, interesting enough, the, the chemotherapeutic didn't have as big a decrease in uh, tumor volume as we would expect it to be. We also looked at uh, a separate patient, and we have a, a very limited number of clones for this patient. So this is patient 008. Um, clone 1 didn't really grow very well on culture, so it, it's very difficult to get enough cells for each one of these tests. So we've only been able to test three drugs on this patient. Um, for blood volume, sorry, for tumor volume, uh, there's, there's not much going on here. There might be an effect to the serolimus. Um, if we look at the vascularity as measured by power Doppler, again, we the, the Tumors, because they're very, oh, I actually didn't mention that, because the tumors are very, very small, um, contrast-enhanced data isn't really applicable to this, 
uh, we get a very limited set of uh, signal samples for the, the very small cross-section of tumor. And so um, we're not getting good perfusion data. So we've had to rely on just power Doppler in this case. Um, but we see that serial lemus uh, appears to be responding quite well in the, for, for this patient. And we looked at uh, also clone five. So this is patient 008 uh, primary core five. Uh, and this one grew up a lot better. And we're able to test a, a more in-depth panel of drugs here. And you can see that you know, sinitinib, pazopinib, exitinib, none of them are really performing well. Uh, Sphoropinib, not so much. Serolimus, again, uh, for this patient, appears to be the drug of choice. We have two of their cores responding like, very well to it. And the other two, maybe Turacel, but aren't really showing much in the way of, of a response. And so we can, we can conclude from the, the patient-derived cell line stuff that drug sensitivity and resistance appears to be a, a stochastic process or, or like a, a random process. So sensitivity to serolimus or sensitivity to sinitinib or resistance to sinitinib doesn't imp really tell you any other information about how these tumor will respond to pisopinib or exitinib or sorofinib or what have you. So you have to test each drug individually. And, and secondly, um, each core biopsy also is more or less independent from the other ones. So you have to test not only every drug, but you also have to test every core. So um, you have to test just, we just got the shotgun. You have to do everything uh, to, to get a, a good view of what's going to happen with this patient. And so this brings us to the conclusion um, where we know that the, the CAM model can be used to screen for patient-specific drug response to the direct engraftment of patient tumor fragments. Uh, tumor's subtype appears to be consistent and unchanged following the engraftments, and some preliminary, preliminary results uh, show that a, a drug-resistant phenotype is, is maintained following the engraftment on the CAM. Ultrasound is really the modality you want to be using if you're doing any sort of uh, CAM xenograft stuff. Um, it, it greatly outperforms everything that we've tried so far, um, and it provides useful non-destructive quantification of tumor volume, blood flow, and perfusion. Um, and uh, the results of the study um, will be compared to clinical outcomes when those become available. Again, this is still a very, very early study. And so I'll, I'll thank you for your time, and I'm, I'm open to any questions. Okay, great. Uh, well, on behalf of all of our audience today, I really want to thank you, Matt, for your great presentation here. Uh, there were some really awesome images that uh, I'm sure everyone really enjoyed uh, viewing. And at this time, I just want to encourage, we are low on time here, but we'd like to take a couple questions. So please use your chat on the right-hand side of the window to uh, chat to the host and indicate any questions you might have. Um, while, while you're doing so, we do have one question here. Uh, Matt, when, uh, for the contrast imaging you were doing, how did you determine the margins of the tumor? So when you showed the contrast images, it looked like it might be a little difficult to determine where to actually draw that tumor volume. Um, there, there are a couple of things that you can, you can use to guide yourself. Um, generally, from, from what I've seen, and, and again, I have a lot of experience in doing this. I've been doing this road, I've been doing this particular type of study for about two years now, so it, it's, I can just kind of see it. But um, if you're doing a destruction reperfusion um, imaging um, technique, then what you want to do is you want to segment the tumor periphery uh, using the BMO data set. So every frame you get a BMO image as well as the nonlinear contrast image. Um, so if you wait until just after the first destruction frame when all the contrast data is gone, uh, the BMO image is really what you want to focus on. The, the tumor boundary, the tumor periphery, um, is the easiest to delineate in that case. Okay, great. Um, take maybe one more question here. Um, Matt, what would you see as kind of the next step for this project? What would need to be done, in other, in, in other words, for this to move, this kind of protocol to move to the clinic? Uh, realistically, we need, we need more, like a, a larger data set, right? So we're able to classify the tumors right now, but we have classification on an individual core basis. So you have, say, say you focus on the patient that um, the vast majority of their cores seem to be sensitive to sinitinib, but like one or two were not. Um, if that patient undergoes sinitinib therapy and then we find out that, you know, they didn't respond well, then that means that 
a single core that's resistant um, means that this patient should be pursuing some other form of drug therapy. Uh, on, and further to that point, so we need to know, you know, if we get six cores and how many of them need to be resistant before the patient itself is resistant to the therapy, and two, uh, how many cores are actually required to be studied. So we're focusing on, you know, five or six cores for primary tumor and as many metastatic biopsies as we can get, but should we be doing more? Do we need, you know, 10 or 20? Um, and at that point, it becomes really difficult to, to actually do the study realistically. On the flip side, uh, can we get away with only doing four or three cores? And if we can, then we can start doing interesting things like, um, or sorry, really interesting things, like taking, you know, the same number of animals, so 360, that's, it's, it's not fun to do the scan, but it's possible, right? Um, if we can have the number of cores we need to study, then we can increase the number of drugs that we test on the direct fragment stuff. So right now we, we can determine, you know, this patient is probably going to be resistant to sinitinib, but does that mean they should go on pazopinib instead? Or does that mean um, they should go on one of the other handful of drugs that you can select for this? So if we can get away with, say, three cores, we could test. Um, sinitinib, pazopinib, and say exitinib, and say definitively or not, you know, this patient, uh, these three frontline therapies, they're the ones you should be using, or, you know, only focus on this one or that one. Okay, great. Thank you so much, Matt. Uh, so, in regards to time, I think we're going to end this session for today, but I do want to thank you, Matt, so much for your great presentation. Uh, as well, I want to thank everyone who's uh, signed on today to uh, participate in our webinar series. And I encourage you to keep up to date with us and check out our subsequent web webinars that are being announced on our website. Thanks so much.